uh, by bringing in Mr. Rick McCoy. Rick McCoy is Director of Van Wert County, Ohio, Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. He has been a director for the past 26 and a half years. McCoy has appeared on the Weather Channel's Forecast Earth and Storm Stories programs. He's also been featured on National Geographic as well as the History Channel. McCoy is well known for developing the Storm Ready program in Van Wert County in January 2002. This is important because on November 10, 2002, a devastating, EF, a devastating F4 tornado ravaged the county and he was credited with saving hundreds of lives through his program. Because of his actions, he was the first person in the United States to receive the National Storm Her uh, Ready Heroes Award from the U.S. Department of Commerce. He was also awarded the uh, NOAA Weather and All Hazards Radio Park <coughs> Trail Award in Washington, D.C. Director McCoy has spoken at numerous EMA and National Weather Service conferences around the country about severe weather preparedness, as well as the November 10th event. McCoy has a meteorological background with Mississippi State University and has also worked part-time for the uh, CBS affiliate Wayne TV 15 in Fort Wayne, Indiana, as a weekend weather personality from 1995 through 2000. He created and chaired the task force in the early 1990s, which was successful in acquiring an additional weather service office being placed in North Webster, Indiana. He is currently the Storm Ready Chairman for EMA Directors in Ohio and was a former Deputy Sheriff for 10 years in Van Wert County. McCoy's County of Van Wert ranks number one in the state of Ohio in the number of tornadoes to strike the county, with 31 documented tornadoes in his 26 and a half years. Please, shout, or please show a warm welcome for Director Rick McCoy. Thank you for coming today. Um, I was here after the 2002 tornado, and I'm actually going to share a little bit of that information uh, in this uh, program today. This was the, uh, the event uh, as it unfolded in Bower County. It had just come out of Indiana, and this is the view that the spotters had as it came into Van Wert. Now for you as, as a broadcast meteorologists or those studying to be meteorologists for the weather service or weather service employees or spotters, uh, this is a wild sight in Ohio. Yeah. Uh, for the emergency management director, it's, oh crap. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm not a normal emergency management director uh, because I've, I've been on TV, I've as a deputy, so I, I spotted for storms. I've, I went out with the uh, meteorologist from the Norman office and chased out in the plains. And so when I see this, it's like, yeah, here we go. <laughs> so it, it was one of those days, a very interesting day. I like to use that slide. I, I hope offices, you never put something like this out. <laughs> but this is what I sort of felt like that day. It was like one of those that, you know, I'm not ready for, and here it comes, and it became very interesting. This is the uh, history that I've had in, in Bangor County. Again, 31 tornadoes in the years that I've been director, and prior to August, I had never had a tornado in that month. Plus, we've never had one in the month of December. Every place else, we've had plenty of tornadoes, and of course, we, you see we peak here in the June month. But again, we've got that active fall season, and uh, certainly this was one of those events that you know, never had a tornado in August, and it, it sort of caught us off guard that day. This is the map of Van Wert County and all the tornadoes that it went through. Uh, the red is, is the F4s, so again, the Palm Sunday 1965 event hit us. I remember that as a little boy, as that storm came through, that's probably what got me interested in weather. Uh, the 2002 tornado up here. And so we've had our share, for some reason, uh, across that county. This was uh, the 2002 event, uh, a famous photo that went worldwide in, in uh, TV networks and papers across our, our globe uh, that showed the movie theater that was hit at the time. And of course, uh, everyone knows that uh, there were many children saved that day that had been sitting in these seats just prior to the tornado hitting. Santa Claus 2 had just came out, and they moved them into this cinder block area after I had hit the sirens and put the warnings out, and everybody was saved there. So that was a, a real miraculous uh, situation. Uh, that particular tornado, again, 
uh, a fall event, November the 10th. It was Veterans Day weekend, 3.28 in the afternoon. That tornado was a half a mile wide. We did have several deaths, uh, a lot of economic damage within the county. This is when the tornado first touched down, which is normally what we're used to in Ohio of seeing one like this. But again, it, it grew to a very large, massive wedge tornado. Uh, the path, uh, it was on the ground several times in Indiana. The supercell uh, storm lifted here at the state line, back down in Van Wert, and then continued up for another 53 miles in Ohio. And some of the damage uh, that we had with that particular event in the county, a lot of homes uh, completely destroyed or, or even some cases wiped clean. These are factories that were hit, and what we learned from that event that's helped us with recent tornadoes is, you know, this was Veterans Day weekend, it was a Sunday, those factories were closed. Had they been open at the time, we've had about 400 employees in there that would have taken the fury of an F4 tornado. Whether they would have survived, I don't know. So as our factories rebuilt, uh, they put in large restrooms that were safe rooms. <coughs> Some actually built basements, enough for their employees. So this is what we need to learn across our country, that when we have these big events and, and these locations are rebuilding or new facilities are going up, they need to get safe place for their employees. Automobiles. Uh, Nick, I think you mentioned uh, the one fellow left his house in his car and got away from the tornado. And this is why we don't want people in vehicles. And one of our deaths was in a vehicle that day. I remember growing up, and many of you probably do also, that we were always told, get in the ditch, get in the ditch, get in the ditch. The ditch is the last resort. If you can get out of the tornado's way, do that, as that gentleman did uh, that Nick was talking about. So if it's several miles away and you can see it coming, and normally our, our Ohio tornadoes are moving 60, 65 mile an hour, drive away from it at 90 to 100 mile an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get caught in it. You're not going to get packed, uh, picked up by the state trooper because he's going to pass you. Trying to <laughs> so get out of his way if you can. But if you can't, then uh, yes. The ditch is the last resort. But if you got that culvert underneath the roadway, that, that's of course better. <coughs> and of course we learned from the derecho, which really got going over in northeastern Indiana and came through Fort Wayne and right across my county with winds of 90 to 100 mile an hour. And we had power outages in that event for 11 days across my county. So we've used that November event, we used the derecho event in some of our planning today of what we want to be doing. And even in derechos, you get gust nados. I have quite a few gust nados that hit my county for some reason. And this is one of those in that derecho event. So we come to August the 24th. Most of our tornadoes are wrapped in rain around Ohio, as you know. This was one of those events that wasn't right out there in the open. There was no lightning. So people standing outside videotaping, they didn't have to worry about getting struck with lightning. There wasn't it. On the ground. Tornado currently on the ground. Yeah. 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 So this is just after the first tornado touched down. And again, we, we got multiple videos of, of this event. Four tornadoes that day that, that touched in my county. One thing that I did after we seen the 2002 event and the derecho was I determined we've got to get a NOAA weather radio in every business in the county. You know, we preach to the public, get one for your home. But businesses, they just didn't buy them. And so uh, I had went out after a federal mitigation grant 
and I purchased a weather radio that it, we have one in every single business in our county now. So they're getting all the alerts as they're coming out from the National Weather Service. Uh, Facebook, very popular, uh, and I have my uh, page on there. The most hits that I've ever gotten in a, an event in a 24-hour <coughs> period is 65,000 hits. So a lot of people, not only in my county, but in the surrounding area in Indiana, follow that um, because I'm putting information out. And I put the day-to-day -day forecast on there and uh, general information. I use Baron radar within the office, radar scope, storm lab and interwarn, JR level two and three, and I added those uh, after the August event. So, every day when I get up in the morning, I turn on the weather channel. <laughs> and then I get on the computer, and I check to see what the day looks like. So, you know, this is what that day looked like for me, August the 24th. I'm thinking, huh, no problem. And I'm looking at the tornado outlet, and out there to the west, so... It's going to be a regular August summer day for us. And, of course, in the afternoon, the tornado watch came out. Now, Van Wert County is right there. We're not in the watch area. But I think it's important to remember, we always hear that phrase, if you're in or near the watch area. So, you need to start paying attention, because I thought... Maybe I ought to watch this situation. Kokomo had just gotten hit. And I only activate my EOC if I'm in a watch. In this situation, I decide I'm going into the office. I'm going to track the storms as they're coming across Indiana. And so the outbreak begins. And so here's Kokomo. So I'm looking at that. Right here is Van <coughs> County. And I'm looking at the Kokomo storm, and I'm tracking it, and it's going due east. So I'm going to be safe. It's going to stay in the watch area. And I actually contacted Mercer County. Mike Robbins, the director of Mercer County, is here. I contacted them and said, it's going to come your way. <laughs> so I, I've activated and, and monitoring the situation there. And, of course, these are all the polygons that went out that day. So we're, we're interested in down here, the Kokomo storm. Here's Kokomo. So as you watch the warning box come out, it's going straight east, straight east, and I'm feeling real comfortable. <laughs> straight east. And then we get over here and voila. <laughs> now that was the time I did say, oh crap. But again, as we look at the rotational tracks also, again, Van works over here. Kokomo, look at the rotational tracks. We're going straight east, straight east, straight east. And then, boom. So the, the, everything changed at that moment, moment. So I was like Ziggy there, run. So communications are taking place. And I'm talking with the Weather Service in Northern Indiana. If, if they get knocked off the air, then I'm going to start talking with Wilmington. And all kinds of information coming into my office. And many EMA directors have this across our state, where they, they've got television, cable access, they've got different computers, whatever radar programs that they're using. We're coordinating with amateur radio, emergency alert system. And so, as I'm seeing this come closer to us, I decide I better activate the spotter network. So, in my county, I page out all the fire departments. <coughs> And so they go out with all their trucks and squads and set throughout the county. I activate the amateur radio operators, and then all the deputy sheriffs, state patrol, city police and armed patrol, I have communications with all of them. So they don't have to go through 911 central dispatch to talk. They can, we can talk back and forth direct, which really helps us in timing. And so the warning is issued. This is what uh, everything looks like as it comes into the county. And I've got redundancy of getting those warnings, so not only EAS, but the MWIM program and interwarn, I get the warning statement. And again, that's the, the first shot that we saw the tornado lifted, and this is just entering the southeastern part of the county. 
So I'm putting statements out, statements on, on where the storm is, where we're expecting it to go. I'm also using Nixle. So students here on campus, if there's an emergency message, you get that on your cell phone. We have the same program, Nixle, we type it in, off it goes, everybody that's signed up in the county, their cell phone will go off. And the, war the statement I put out there, tornado warning for Wilshire and Ohio City, tornado on the ground, six miles from the state line, southern Van Wert County will be affected. And then the sirens are activated. So I activate the sirens in my county. Some of your counties, the 911 dispatch does that. Some of your counties, the fire chiefs may do that. It differs across the state. We have those sirens in our villages and cities. New sirens that are be put, being put in today, they do have a battery backup system. Some of your older sirens out there, if the power goes out, the sirens will not work. We make sure in our county the public understands what that means. That the steady tone means it's a tornado warning. If it's a whale cone enemy attack, that ding bad in North Korea probably launched something. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do not use a siren for all clear. And that still differs around the state. Some communities still use sirens for all clear. I believe that once it's passed, the siren should be silent. If it's coming at you, the siren should be blowing. So the monitors that I have in a lot of special locations, I have in all the schools, at the courthouse and government buildings, in the nursing homes, hospital, libraries, at the county fair. Our county fair actually was the next week after this event. And so one of my spotters out there, uh, Phil Sonier, this is a snapshot that he took on his cell phone, and this is what he was seeing at that time. So again, he's south of the storm, real good positioning. He's keeping himself safe, as we're teaching all spotters to do. He's not an amateur, so on his cell phone, he's actually calling in and giving reports to the office. And we've talked about drones. A month before this event, I bought a Phantom 4. <laughs> and Unfortunately, I was in the office, so I couldn't fly it out there with the tornado. That would have been really great. <laughs> but uh, afterwards, the day after, as I went out and done the damage survey with the weather service, I took the drone. <coughs> and again, real good footage. So what's nice about this is, you know, if we've got a, if it's rain-wrapped tornado, we don't know if there was a tornado actually there, we can go out, see what damage have we got. Did we have a microburst that went through? You know, do we have divergence or convergence? So here, very evident of what we had taking place. And of course, on the drones, we have the movie option also, not just the photos. So you can see as the tornado is moving off to the northeast. This is not only good for our assessment, it's, it's great for farmers, because we can go back to the farmer and say, you've got debris here, 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 you need to clean that up before you try to get in and get that corn off, if there's any corn to harvest. But it's also good for the insurance companies. And farmers have asked me for that data because we can show them, you know, this is going to be the loss that this fellow is going to be claiming. The tornado here, this is still tornado number one. Even though it's a weak tornado, damage from this right here was EF1. Uh, we did have some multiple vortices in it. And there's the barn it had just hit. That was probably about 900 yards from that barn when I was, that video was being taken right there. So over here is myself flying the drone and the National Weather Service survey team. And this video is not going to run, is it? That's the one that we tried to uh, sync up. Let's see if it runs. No? Okay, we'll go by that. It's not going to sync up. Unless you're going to try it. <laughs> Okay, we'll continue on. All right, 
Mark's radios was mentioned. And if you're not familiar with Mark's, that is a statewide radio system that was put in across Ohio that all the emergency response agencies have, hospitals, and it is interconnected around the state. Originally it was 800 megahertz, now it's 700 megahertz. And uh, I can get in my truck out here and I can talk back home, or I can talk to Cincinnati or Chillicothe or Cleveland. <coughs> Anybody that's got that radio there, we can talk interoperability across the state. And this was very valuable during that severe weather event because the WCM at North Webster was on their Marks radio. And so within my consulate, I went to Marks and were giving them reports back and forth. So not only amateur radio, chat, but marks has become very important to us. Can you turn that up? So in the background, she's got her own weather radio. The warning is playing there, saving the tornadoes on the ground in Bower County, confirmed by emergency management, and she's videotaping it to say that. <laughs> so we had our second spin up. So tornado number one is still on the ground. The second one spins up two mesos here, very clear. And so we've got the NWS chat. And this is, and then we get number three that spins up. At a wind farm. <laughs> that particular wind farm provides all of the electricity for the Ohio State campus. Your campus is buying all the energy from that wind farm. So if it went down, you'd have been out. <laughs> but it did, uh, it actually came down right beyond the wind farm. And this is the other one that I don't think it's going to sync up either. See if you can get this one to go. I want to see if we can get the uh, reports coming out. So the good thing about the amateurs out there that day was they were giving me play-by-play -play action we had state patrol deputy sheriffs giving me everything they were seeing, fire departments, so that was great. The problem with that was it was too much. And so with all this technology and everything that we have, it's important that you've got help. On this particular day, I didn't think we were going to get hit. And so I didn't have someone to run the amateur net in the office with me and anyone else manning the phones and the other radios. It was just me when the event unfolded. So I've got about 11 radios screaming at me, uh, and I'm trying to take that in, plus watching chat, putting stuff out on, on the internet, and uh, a very interesting event. And then we had tornado number four. Again, drone footage. So again, you can see we've got very intense here. But this 40-acre field, we've got damage uh, clear over here. And again, the drone footage on it. So this is uh, tornado number four, cutting through the cornfield. Wasn't strong enough to take down these high-tension lines. Eventually, it went over and it hit this house here. And then this is a field up here that's hit. So certainly the drones are the future for what we want to be doing. And I'm hoping at some point uh, the Weather Service will be allowed to have their own drones, but I don't think that's been allowed at the national level yet. Uh, so again, they're relying on the amateur folks out there or emergency management that might have them to collect this information for them. So what are some of the lessons that we learned from that? You know, tornadoes can happen in any month in our state. We need to be ready 
whether we're in the watch or near the watch, we want to be using all the technology that we have out here today because there's a lot of it available to both us and to the public. We want to make sure we've got enough personnel in the office ahead of time to handle the situation. And remember that not all of the emergency management agencies activate for storms. You have a lot of agencies, and I've seen this in Indiana and Ohio, that uh, they feel they're not a meteorologist, they shouldn't be doing weather reports, and say they don't go into the office at all. They go after the fact when they start looking at damage assessments. Some EMAs will activate, so it varies across our state. 911 centers are going to be overloaded, and they may not be able to relay information to the National Weather Service. If the emergency management has not activated, the only information the Weather Service may be getting is through chat or amateur radio, because that 911 dispatcher sitting in there is getting a multitude of calls. They're setting off the sirens. Everybody that hears a siren then is wondering why it's going off, so they're calling 911. What, what is this blowing for? So dispatchers cannot handle some of the things that we need to be doing of getting information back out to the public and to the weather service. The sirens activate differently in Ohio. So again, that's very important to remember. And it's that way across the nation. In the civil defense era, the federal government said, you shall sound your sirens in this method. When civil defense went away and we became disaster services and emergency management across this country, the federal government said it's up to every community how you want to do it. And so neighboring counties may do it exactly the opposite of what you do. So you have to remember that as you're traveling around the state and around the country. Using drones, very helpful for our assessments. And warnings, countywide or polygon. We used to be countywide, and then we started using the polygons, and I've tried to educate my public, this is the way it's going to work. So when that tornado first came in to Van Wert County in the August event, I'm setting off the sirens in just the polygon area. We start getting calls from people outside of that area, why aren't our sirens blowing? Even government officials in villages afterwards, why didn't you set off our sirens? It's because you weren't in the polygon area. So even though we're trying to go that route, people still want their sirens to be going off because they can see it in the distance and their siren in their town is not blowing. Okay, any questions real quick? Actually, you keep moving for Dr. Forbes here. And actually you can sit uh, Rick, could you stay up here for a yes. minute? And we'd like to invite Ariel and and Jay as well up to the stage to answer any questions from their presentations as well, since we didn't get that uh, opportunity so far. So Nick, also is Nick still there? Nick. Um, I don't think is Nick still here. I think he went back to Cleveland, so that's why. Okay, it's just you two. So if there's any if there's any questions, Alex will come by with the microphone. So. Ultimately, 
that initial sign that things were changing by the tornado watch was issued well out of the tornado probability area was a very clear sign that things were changing. And as you indicated, this idea of going towards these four-hour tornado probabilities in order to provide a more frequently updating, fresher perspective with higher temporal uh, precision about the risk for tornado provides a great opportunity to investigate how we can adapt the forecast, have more malleable as the environment changes rapidly, uh, but this, yeah, as you indicated, provides a lot of opportunity for investigation uh, down the road and certainly can provide a much uh, more uh, impact forecasting on um, based decision support services as well as those tornado probabilities that ramp up quickly going into those four hour periods. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Oh. <coughs> for you, actually. For okay. Uh, I, just quick one. Are there any actual graduate level case studies being done on the 24th of August down at OU or anywhere that you know of? I can't think of any ones in particular, but I would say it's very highly likely this is the kind of case that uh, numerical modelers are really interested in terms of how we can make minor tweaks to microphysical schemes, planetary boundary layer parameterization schemes to see how small adjustments and sensitivities manifest themselves in variations in the convective morphology as well as the environment. And so this provides a really a sense of case kind of analogous to some extent to the May 3rd, 1999 case where we were dealing with a very, very volatile environment and if we launched enough storms today, yeah, we got very significant supercells, but how, we, how many storms are we actually going to have? There's some similarities to this particular case as well. And so it's definitely, I would say, likely going to be the focus of a lot of numerical weather prediction, uh, modeling studies, um, in terms of understanding exactly how we can best simulate uh, the types of very high impact weather we're produced. You talked a lot about uh, high end tornadoes, low end tornadoes, over warning, under warning. Well, nobody said anything about tornado emergencies. How do you see that being used here in the future? I know it's a product, uh, but you don't hear much talk about it. I'll address it from a couple of perspectives from the weather service side, and then if you want to take it from some of uh, more of the emergency management side, that would be fantastic. As you know, the tornado emergency is used for cases where we have very high confidence in very, very uh, uh, strong to violent tornadoes. It's to be used when we have, you know, again, that very high level of confidence. We don't want to sensitization to occur with tornado emergencies. Um, it's something that is issued with a consideration of both radar trends as well as reports, ground truth, that really provides major support for spotter networks in terms of getting us the information about what's going on at the ground. Um, and as well as environmental information. And the environment, as you indicated earlier, provides a major uh, perspective in terms of whether or not all that ground truth is going to manifest itself in sustainability of that threat. While there's some gradation in terms of how the tornado emergency language is used, in particular from office to office, the idea is to get at some of the most high impact tornado emergency scenarios and from, uh, or, or cases where we're having high confidence in violent tornado uh, setups, and then I'll pass the mic over, or if you want to come over here, uh, Rick, for emergency management. And I think it's very helpful uh, for us if we get that. If we've got a large, violent tornado coming into a, a town or a city, 10,000 people, 50,000 people, whatever the number might be, and we know that it's very possible we're going to have loss of life because it's such a highly populated area, and it is that big, mean, bad tornado that's coming in. Um, that's going to really catch people's attention. So if the weather service puts out tornado emergency, and, and I get that as an emergency manager, you know, all the flag, red flags go up for me, that bad, bad situation, I've got to get this to the public. And if, if the public also hears me saying tornado emergency, they're going to know, not a good day. i, I got to take action. This is bad. <coughs> that address your question? It does. Thank you. Just one quick comment. Um, I remember back in the November 2002 um, Van Wert tornado, I think that also that night one hit Arcanum. And I noticed that, I remember that day, it was only a severe thunderstorm watch for that whole part of Indiana and Ohio. And I don't remember if they ever upgraded it to tornado watching, because I know I have relatives who live in Arcanum. They were in the middle of that Arcanum tornado that hit. And uh, they lost uh, part of their house and everything. And of course they rebuilt. But it was interesting that those, that those dangerous storms, there was no any discussion of any tornado parameter at all occurring with those storms, and yet that F4 through Van Wert and the F3 through Arcanum was in our, I just wonder if you had any comments about that and how forecasting has changed since then to maybe catch that. 
And I know in that event there was a tornado watch for central Indiana. And yes, we were in a severe thunderstorm watch up uh, to the north. Um, we need to remember, and I try to educate the public with this, is if we have a tornado watch, we're telling people that there could be multiple tornadoes. If we have a severe thunderstorm watch, we still could get tornadoes, but it's only going to be possibly a few. So that's the difference. Every severe thunderstorm watch and every severe thunderstorm warning, we need to treat as there could be a few tornadoes. Tornado watch, more serious situation. Rick has a fantastic answer. In fact, I'm going to build off of what Rick mentioned. We actually have a sentence in severe thunderstorm watches that sometimes severe thunderstorms can and occasionally do produce tornadoes. And that's a very important point there. Since then, you know, we've certainly used that case as an opportunity for uh, building research understanding, knowledge understanding about some of these scenarios where it's dealing with strong vertical wind shear and how rapidly the tornado threat can evolve when we have instability in these cases. And so um, certainly there are a lot of improvements in terms of our understanding of how these events can evolve, how the tornado threat can ramp up with time, and how to handle it in terms of messaging with the awareness of what Rick mentioned here, that tornadoes can happen during severe thunderstorm watches. It's all based on a level of confidence in how we're going to get multiple tornado reports for the tornado watch. I'd like to just add, oh, yeah. just from, a, from a public relations standpoint, you know, I was a journalist, I'm a public relations professional now, and so I dedicate part of my blogging activities to try to help with the public education. And by the way, all of us ought to be doing that, because in your circle of friends, in your family, you are the weather expert. And so you should take that role seriously and provide this same education to the people you know. But the point I wanted to make is people don't yet grasp that the straight line winds of a severe thunderstorm can do more damage than a weak tornado. So anything we can do as we educate the public about the seriousness of a severe thunderstorm can be helpful. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. So one last thing before we get to our last speaker. Thank you.